All right, we are up and running. So happy to have you all here today. I'm sure you've all had enough time now since we're starting late um, to have checked your audio. Um, but if not, and if you are having um, any trouble with audio, please feel free to um, call in. That number's in the chat for you. All right, um, I'd like to welcome you all to our fourth webinar of the 20. 18 IGNIS season, and we're actually almost already done. Our last and final, our fifth webinar is next week, and we'll tell you about that at the end of um, today's um, webinar. So IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's just what we want to do today is to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This webinar series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And normally we have two hosts, but my co-host unfortunately lost his internet about 10 minutes before the webinar was scheduled to start. So you've just, you're stuck with me today. So um, this is Alyssa Sells for those of you that haven't met me or don't know me. And I will share out my contact information with you at the end of the webinar in case you have any follow-up questions. Let me just switch our slide here. All right, so our topic today is personalizing information literacy, and our presenter is the fabulous Derek Jorgensen from Everett Community College. And I'll be doing a little bit um, deeper introduction of him here in just a minute, but we're going to um, get you set up with some technical stuff first. I would like to give a big shout out and a big thank you to Derek for being here today to share his knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. So thank you, Derek. We're really pleased to have you here with us. It's my privilege. Oh, that's so sweet. All right, and um, a note that all of our webinars are captioned, and thank you to ASC for their real-time captioning services. And um, Lenore put the link to the captions into the chat for you just a minute ago, and um, we'll throw that in again just in case anybody's logging in late and um, didn't get that when they logged in. All right, moving on to keyboard shortcuts. Um, let me go ahead and put those into the chat for you as well. Um, there is a link for those if you need the keyboard shortcuts for WebEx. So uh, those are in the chat for you now. And um, as always, we will be recording this webinar, and then you can access those recordings of all of our seasons and of our current season on the ATL blog. That is the Assessment Learning and Teaching blog, and let me go ahead and put that link into the chat for you. There is a drop-down menu on the front page of the blog, and it's just for IGNIS, and you can just drop that menu down and select whatever you want to see. Um, if you're new to IGNIS, you might want to go back and investigate some of our prior years. We've had some really great webinars over the years, and um, I think we're um, doing a fine job with some great webinars um, this year, too. You can also find the schedule on um, the blog and um, I will also give you the information for our fifth and final webinar at the end of um, our webinar today. So um, for those of you that have joined us before, you know that we've switched web conferencing tools. We used to be in Blackboard Collaborate, and um, this year we're in WebEx, so we're going to run through just a very brief in overview of the meeting interface, and um, then I'll do my official introduction um, of Derek. So. Uh, let's see, I just want to tell you about the participants list. Um, you can find the list of participants and the participants tools in the upper kind of right side corner of your screen, and that's the participants panel. And then I think we're going to be using the chat feature today, so be ready to type. Uh, I think Derek has some questions planned for you, so um, feel free to answer the questions he asks using um, the chat feature, and then also if you have questions or comments as we're going, please go ahead and put those into the chat, and I will either interrupt um, Derek if it's super relevant to what he's talking about right at that second, or we will might hold some of those till the end, but um, have no fear, we will get to um, all of those. And be sure to select everyone from your drop-down menu when you're sending a message. I think I disabled it so you can't send messages privately, but just in case, um, do select everyone so we can all read what you have to say. 
All right, if you need to look at any of the help features in the interface, um, you can go ahead and um, use the help link that's kind of towards the upper left middle of your screen. And then um, if you're having trouble seeing the slides, because sometimes they can get kind of tiny depending on the size of screen you're working on, um, there is a full screen option and you can pop yourself into full screen by clicking on those expand arrows near the, the top middle of your screen. Let's see. I hear something going on in chat, but I'm not sure. I have a hand up. Earl. Did you have a question? Yes. Go uh, ahead. Can you can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. That part works. Um, I'm noticing in the uh, participants list some of the little computer monitor icons have a red X off to the upper right hand corner. What is that about? Um, I'm pretty sure that indicates that your audio is muted. So there will, or and or maybe the camera is muted. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it mutes yes. your audio. So I, I think if that. you mute and unmute yourself, that's what that is. I think it's just a secondary indicator. Gotcha. Um, Thank you much. Yeah, no worries. Um, and that brings us, um, I'll probably talk about it here in just a second, but if you do want to speak, like Earl raised his hand and then he verbally asked his question, there is a little microphone icon, and we'll look at a screenshot of that in just a second, but there's a microphone icon to the right of your name if you have your audio set up, and um, you want to make sure that you unmute yourself if you're speaking and to leave yourself muted um, while our presenter's presenting so we don't get lots of background noise. So. All right, let's get back where we were. Oh, we were talking about that full screen. So you can pop yourself into full screen, and then if you get stuck in full screen and want to get out of there, because when you're in full screen, you can't see the chat and some of the other things, um, you can just simply press the escape key on your keyboard, or um, you can hover over near the top of your screen, and a little pop-down menu will come down, and there is um, a key there labeled, um, a button there, a blue button labeled return key. If you press that, it will pop you back into the whole interface view. So um, just um, if you get stuck there, that's how you get out. Okay, um, here's our little tip about raising your hand to ask your question, typing your questions into the chat, and making sure that your microphone is um, muted at the appropriate time. So um, any other questions on the microphone or how any of the tools work before I um, move on over to introducing Derek? Someone's not muted, and uh, Someone's not background muted? noise is coming through. All right. Let me just take care of that. Um, I do have – I'm going to mute everybody right now. I have a button I can press that's mute everyone, so I'm going to – I went ahead and clicked that. You're all muted now. Uh, Derek, when you go to present, you're going to have to unmute yourself, so um, just a, a tip on that. Okay. I'm going to switch over to Derek's slides, and then I am going to introduce him and I will give him the presenter ball so he's ready to go. All right. Okay, Derek, the only thing you'll need to do when I'm done introducing you is unmute yourself and you should be um, ready. Okay, normally at this point, I'd turn it over to Mark to introduce Derek, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that myself. So, um, Derek is a Washington transplant. Uh, he arrived in the Pacific Northwest from North Dakota via um, a Pennsylvania detour. I'd actually like to hear that story sometime. Um, along the way, he's worked as a reference library associate, a basic course director, he's been faculty, and he's been also a researcher at a variety of colleges and universities, so he's got lots of varied experience. He is currently an instructional designer and associate faculty in the communication department at Everett Community College. His first job, other than teaching piano lessons and a newspaper delivery route, was as a radio broadcaster. And he was hired when he was 15, and he had to wait until his 16th birthday to um, start work. So that's kind of an amazing little story. You were very industrious, Derek. I had no other options for entertainment in North Dakota. <laughs> oh, well, at least you kept busy, right? Yes. Yeah. So Derek is an avid baker and a cook in his spare time, and he says regrettably that he is a mostly former runner and biker. So <laughs> um, I'm glad you found baking instead of biking. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I love this. He sent me a whole bunch of things. Um, 
personal stuff to include, and I loved all of them, so um, forgive me. I just indulged myself and put them all in here. That works um, for me. <laughs> <laughs> I really love this one. Um, he says that he once sang backup for Barry Manilow. So um, I think there must be a story there sometimes. <laughs> so um, I'll look forward to hearing that the next time I see you maybe. Don't worry, I won't forget to ask you. And then um, Derek says he's lived in, er in Everett for just shy of three years, um, but he still gets excited about exploring the area for new foods, for hiking trails, breweries, concerts, and friends. So I think you've got a new group of friends here, Derek. We've all yeah, set yeah. up to um, hear what important stuff you have to say today. And um, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to mute my mic and turn it over to you. And if you need anything um, while you're presenting, you just give me a shout, okay? I will do that. Thank you. All so right, much. let's get going. Thanks. And thank you for the warm introduction and welcome. It, oh. It's fun and great to be here. Actually, uh, I was thinking about the things that I do both as the instructional designer and as an instructor at Everett Community College. And there's one assignment that I've done in my interpersonal classes recently that really blends a lot of what I consider to be important elements of an academic experience and it's been designed to just change a relationship that students have with information uh, in our roles no matter what our positions are on a campus or in an agency we're always working with relationships whether it's with our colleagues with students with course content with technology or with research and it was the last one that i really wanted to find a way to change and enhance what is the relationship that people have with research and if we think of the idea of information literacy research is one of the big components and activities that people will engage in when they are encountering information and it's stale for so many people that the process of conducting research and then analyzing it to figure out whether or not it's a good resource is something that just feels arbitrary. And what I wanted to do was find a way to really make it more relevant at a personal level and then also try to humanize it rather than looking at research as just a product to emphasize the relationship that exists between the researcher and the product that they produce in the research that we use as consumers. So today I have four elements essentially that I would like to talk about that blend together ultimately. First is the idea of humanizing the research, personalizing research, evaluating research, and then I will explain how I've found a way I, that I think is really effective in synthesizing those three elements. Um, my PowerPoints are going to be really brief. I teach communication courses, including public speaking classes at times, and one of the things that I always emphasize is don't let the technology replace you as a person. So you'll see just an idea of what I'm going to be expounding on a little bit more, but the words in our conversation gets to have the majority of the content. So with those things previewed, I would like to ask you a series of questions to dive into this process of humanizing research first. First, how many authors do you personally know? I'm gonna let you provide an answer to that one. Go ahead and type your answers into the chat for Derek. Okay. I see that we have one response already that says personally only personally one. one. Mm -hmm. yeah. None. Five to eight us wow. are getting bigger. You many close with several. Nice. Yeah. I'm just impressed by the circles that we are involved with. I'd probably say none for me, because um, I don't want to give away too much of your <laughs> next, of what, you know, what kind of author. Right. So I'll just say none for now. 
Yeah, and I think that what we saw initially, the one or none, is frequently how we think about it. I see none again, research authors, that is, student authors, ton. So I'm seeing some of the responses that really indicate how we differentiate what authorship is. And that's something that students will do too. Frequently if we ask, how many authors do you know, the first idea is that these are people who are writing fiction books or sometimes nonfiction books, but things like textbooks and research usually doesn't pop in there. So I'm going to go to the next slide, which is another question. What do those authors write? For those of you who are responding, I'm seeing some of the detail already in there. We know people who are conducting research and writing. I see technical authors, many, many. And that's one of the things that I overlook at times and I hear my fellow faculty overlook also. Research or books is what these people write. And frequently when we think of research, we forget that there are people who are behind these things. So just to flip the question around a little bit, a perception check is how we talk about this in interpersonal communication. How many of your colleagues, peers, or friends publish research? One of the things that I would fail to do if I were answering these questions for myself, I wouldn't even include myself in the list. It's like, how many authors do I know? It's like, oh, who are the people around me who are doing some? I see the idea of professional articles and peer-reviewed publications, textbook authors, OER authors, all of those count. Those are really important. I have a number of peer-reviewed article publications out there as well. And again, I minimize that role because I divorce that from the idea of being an author. To me, that's a researcher. But when we really think about it, research is frequently authorship. And it's happening all around us. We work in areas where research is conducted with the goal of publishing it so we can share vital information with other people. And there are humans behind the process, something that doesn't necessarily seem to be at the forefront when we think of information literacy. It's generated by regular people in and around us each and every day. And for bullet point there, we actually know some of these people. Beyond that, a number of us are these people. And anytime we have students who are engaging in research, looking for information that can be integrated into the work that they're doing, the scholarly books and articles that they access have a human element that can be emphasized. And in my goal to try to emphasize the relationship Sometimes working with that human side completely shifts how people think about research. And when information literacy is taught and integrated into a course then, it's not just finding an article, it becomes something else. It's engaging with the material and thinking about the people who are involved in the process as well. So, how can this be a multidisciplinary approach is one of the questions I always ask myself when I have an approach that I have found to work well within communication and then want to recommend it to somebody else. So I have another question for you and I'm hoping that you can answer this. Everybody hopefully has an answer. It doesn't have to be your professional role that you're addressing, but what research are you passionate about? If you're thinking about what is it that you are always excited to read more about, can you pick that topic? I see quality assurance in hybrid and online course design. I'm right with you on that page. Emerging technologies for education and student retention. Color theory.
I'll admit that one of the things that I constantly like researching is food related. It's not my job, but as Alyssa mentioned in the introduction, I'm an avid baker. Oh, I see another me too. <laughs> so there are things that we constantly like to look and find information about. And in that regard, we're not different than people that we are working with or if we're in a teaching role, our students. People want to find information and again, frequently we think of it as a product or a commodity that we can consume rather than letting it be healthy or, uh, sorry, healthy diet alternatives. I see that's probably something I should get passionate about as a former runner. Yeah, but, that's a good one. I'm only collecting recipes full of fat and sugar. <laughs> and I'm cooking with the fat yeah. and sugar. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. All the way. Earl, you got you got your eye on us. <laughs> so again, trying to find what it is that is relevant. I'm trying to go the other way. Good for you. I need to follow your example, Earl. So thinking about what's passionate to us. We might try to put ourselves in the minds of the people that we're engaging with. What could they be passionate about or what we can we get them passionate about? And that this question can be rhetorical. Who else should be interested in that research? We were making connections with the responses that you had, but frequently excitement can be contagious even when it comes to a topic like information literacy. And what I try to do in my classes is find theories that are very practical and applicable and let that be a focus for research so students can not only see what it is that might be interesting, but something that they can actually use. So what I really try to do is look for ways to connect people to the theories. and at times this really means just pointing out how we are living and already engaging with ideas and concepts that happen to have theories attached to them. And I probably have an easier time doing this because of my discipline that I teach in. Communication is about something we all do every day essentially but I'm seeing that lots of you are doing other things like trying to relate success stories to share and demonstrate. That's an excellent example. Thank you, Earl. And again, how do we know what success is and what is it that we demonstrate? Usually we can look for best practices as one of the examples and in some of the academic settings, it's going to theory specifically. So for me, in my interpersonal communication class that I teach most quarters, I have found a theory is called communication privacy management. And it really is a nice practical and applied theory that gives us a better understanding of what information we should disclose to other people. Self-disclosure is a big topic in interpersonal communication to begin with, but how it has been approached within the discipline in the past is people have different preferences. What's private to one person might be public to somebody else. And that was kind of where the idea stopped until this new theory was developed, communication privacy management. And it's a fairly new theory in the grand scheme of academics. Uh, the primary author or inventor of the theory, Sandra Petronio, started publishing in about 2007 regarding communication privacy management. And while it's not in the textbook that my class uses, it's an enhancement and something that I can let my students know about and have them research and then engage in the idea of doing research. But I know the people behind the research. So uh, it's something that I know that they're going to be engaging in. They have an assignment where research is required, but I know who the people are behind them and I know that I'm going to be introducing them to these people. And it's again going back to the idea of humanizing the theory that hopefully by default is personalizable because of its applied nature. 
So the third element of information literacy is really letting students know how to evaluate research. Uh, frequently, libraries are great at helping students know how to check the credibility of sources, and that's a big part of information literacy. One thing that I will let everyone know is that when you have a local library, they are creating excellent resources that are built on your local access to databases and other sorts of resources, and I can't promote them enough. I don't do it just because I worked in libraries for 15 years. I do it because it's really, really fantastic information that deserves being promoted, and we can get a lot of benefit out of it just like our colleagues and our students can. But when it comes to evaluating the research, information literacy can extend beyond the credibility check. Just the idea of using peer-reviewed only sources is where some people draw the line, but you can go beyond that a lot. And what I've found with my students is that when you describe what it requires to get an article published in a peer-reviewed journal, it completely changes how they approach what it is that they're seeing when they conduct information searches in a library database. So one of the things that I do is talk about conducting original research, just doing it on my own or in a team, and then what the process entails of submitting it to a journal and having the editor send it off for a double blind review and then the revision process if you're lucky enough to get a revise and resubmit or an acceptance letter. And just adding some transparency to that process shifts their thoughts as to what rigor goes into producing the information that's consumable. And again, it's starting to really humanize the information, realizing that it can be a grueling and taxing process to get things into a journal. It's almost a layer of respect that might not have been there initially. So one of the third elements I try to do when it comes to evaluating research is identifying the people involved in the process. And a number of those are the people I was just mentioning, the authors themselves, as well as the journal editors, and then the idea of the peer reviewers. Who are those people who are looking at your research and why do their opinions matter and how do they get into the situation where they have some power to say, yes, this is good, or you need to change that. And students are often just shocked to realize that there are you know, professors doing research in their field, and they've been doing it for decades, and they still have to revise and resubmit. So like, it's almost like their stuff is being graded. It's like, that's exactly what it's like. Just like when you do multiple revisions of papers or assignments, that's what's happening with the research that you're consuming as well. And the last thing that I really try to do, and a lot of my ability to do so is just based out of fortune. I mean, one of the things I ask, how in North Dakota did I end up singing backup for Barry Manilow? It's weird, it's a great story, you should hear it sometime. But also, how do we get to know the people who are involved in the research process? The PhD program I went through was research intensive. So one of the requirements we had was to have two articles in press before we were allowed to schedule our comprehensive exams. Because of that, my cohort of students were all researchers. We've all spread out across the country, and communication is a smaller discipline than some, but I know people who have continued to do lots of research and one of my good friends just became the editor of a journal that I use a lot in my interpersonal communication classes. So I can provide access to some of the people involved in the process. But if you think back to the questions that you were answering early on in the session, who are the authors that you know? You have these connections as well. It might not be a journal editor, but you know researchers, you know authors, 
you are researchers and you are authors as well. So we know people and one of the things that I would like to emphasize or let you know is that most researchers and authors love to talk about their work. It's wonderful to have things in press to get the publications, but that's not the only place we want people to encounter these ideas. And I have really gone out of my way to try to let people have a platform to engage with their ideas, both the authors and then students who have questions about the material beyond what they're doing. So ultimately, I have synthesized the three ideas of humanizing information literacy, personalizing information literacy, and then the evaluation process as part of information literacy into one specific assignment. So this could potentially be a model, and if you think of how it could be developed in different disciplines, I invite you to do so, and I think you'll see some transferable elements at the very least. But what I do is I introduce a theory related to the course. For me, it's communication privacy management, which I was mentioning before, the idea of how we choose to share what could be private or secret information. I build in instruction on how to find academic sources, specifically the use of library databases. This is one of the times that you could really rely on your local library. I know that our faculty and reference librarians offer information literacy courses. They are happy to come to your classes and do a demonstration of how to conduct research using your specific library databases. Because of my background in libraries, I just do this myself. But teaching students how to conduct good discipline-specific or course-specific research is a great skill set in and of itself. But beyond teaching how to find academic sources, I have my students create an annotated bibliography. And this is where I begin a scaffolded assignment where students initially do an individual annotated bibliography. And usually I ask them to find five to seven peer reviewed articles on communication privacy management, knowing that what comes next is they're going to be in a group all looking at communication privacy management within a specific setting or context. And they're going to be creating a master group annotated bibliography with what they consider the best 10 or 12 sources. So they are exploring the credibility of the sources as they are doing an annotated bibliography. It's not just finding the article, it's getting to know who the author is, what is typically in a particular publication. And this also allows the getting to know the author element through the research. And again, I strategically chose communication privacy management because it is fairly new. There aren't a whole, whole lot of people who are doing research in it. And I know the people who are involved in that research. So the fourth element on this slide, my students actually get to interact with an author. And for me, this is fun because I'm using technology to remotely bring people in. To me, this means that my friend Jeff will Skype or use Google to do a video instruction session with my classes. He has authored a lot of articles on communication privacy management as well. He's also the one who's now the editor for the journal Family Communication. He's my good friend. And he loves to teach. He does a great job of it. He's a full faculty member at Kent State University. But it's that personal connection that matters. And again, we all have these personal connections. And with this sort of approach, it lets us bring other people in. And it affords people who are teaching hybrid and online classes to have the similar sort of situation where you don't have to be face to face to have these personal connections. It's great. So the fifth element, I situate the ideas. And this is going back to the personalizing the information literacy. All of my students are doing research on communication privacy management, but they get to choose how it's going to be applied. 
they choose a context for their group and try to explore what are the rules and norms regarding communication privacy management in different settings. For example, we treat privacy management differently when we're engaging online. That's one of the things we can all relate to right now since that is the communication channel we're doing. And we behave completely differently than we do in other contexts. And they can learn more about that if that's what is really interesting to them. Uh, other options could be communication privacy management in our family settings or communication privacy management in the workplace communication privacy management in romantic relationships. There are health contexts and a, just a vast array of others and students can generate these on their own or I can give them options, but allowing students to situate ideas again lets them personalize the theories and really start to have a different relationship with the information that's out there. And ultimately, what I'm looking for is my students to demonstrate a mastery of the ideas through a presentation with real world advice. And so in communication, we have lots of gray area where it's recommended to do something or a best practice, we can all relate to that idea, is a certain approach. But what my students get to do is give the rest of the class an idea of what would be recommended if you're in these different settings. What is normal or appropriate to share regarding privacy? How much information is too much information? And they're going back to the research and they know who the people are and they have asked questions about it and they have had an opportunity to ask some of the authors what they think about things that they haven't seen in the literature as well. So it's a nice synthesis, again, of all the pieces. They can see that there are actual people coming up with these ideas. And one of the things that my friend who Skypes in does a great job of is he will tell them, you know, no one has really researched that yet, but you should. And the sense of empowerment is really, really amazing to see people. I've had students just completely transform their thinking as to what they are capable of when here is someone who has published so many articles is telling them you have great ideas and that would be the basis of an article in and of itself. So again, it's an approach to information literacy that I've found that really attaches people to it. It lets it be grounded and meaningful to students because there are lots of different ways it can be applied. And at the same time, they get a sense of how to conduct research and how to really choose what's val valuable, what's credible, and what's valid. And that's the end of my prepared remarks. So I can turn it over to questions. I noticed that there was a question earlier on that Alyssa said that she was going to bring to my attention. Yep. Um, Zoe asked a question in the chat, and I'm just going to read exactly what she says. Um, it was on the slide where you were talking about peer review. Uh, she says, I'm curious if you talk about bias and whiteness in peer review scholarly publishing with students. That's a great question. I haven't specifically framed it within the context of bias and whiteness in peer review or scholarly publishing. One of the things that I have talked about, though, is how the blind peer review process very frequently isn't blind review because communication is such a small discipline. If you know who is doing research in any given field, there's just a handful of people you know who are going to be asked to review things. So in a way, there is potentially the bias built in, and uh, I personally have taken some proactive measures when I'm submitting to certain journals, knowing who's on the review board as to citing certain people. But it's something that would be really, really valuable for a number of students to understand and know more about. And I'm going to make a point of bringing that into the conversation.
Great. Do we have any other questions? I don't see that anybody's um, typed anything else. Uh, Zoe, I think this Zoe. is a follow-up from Zoe. Mm -hmm. She says, I'm also thinking that talking about scholarly publishing requires talking about the hierarchies of academia, who has the time to conduct research, tenure-track faculty, who are overwhelmingly white, she says, um, editors, peer reviewers, mostly white, and so on. That's just her follow-up comment. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I've encountered is that research is a time-intensive process and that traditionally, yes, we very much have seen the hierarchy influence it. But if you look at the current publication approaches and who actually is doing the majority of research now, there seems to be a slight shift that it is becoming a bigger, broader element of things, like the fact that as a grad student, a lot of programs are emphasizing the need to have things. That's a great citation, the demographics of scholarly publishing and communication professionals. Uh, new journals are being created also, and technology is starting to afford more voices, which is great. And I think it reflects on the need to think possibly differently about how we determine what is credible research or not. That the traditional idea of only information from a peer-reviewed nonprofit journal is going to have credible information that we need to look more specifically at what's there and understand the limits of the system. It really is competitive if you look at how much research is submitted and is instantly rejected. There are so many voices that don't ever get the platform and it's not because the research isn't valuable. I think that's something that academics at large would benefit from reviewing and thinking about. Yep, it's always in agreement with your comments mm -hmm. and she says thanks for taking on this question and sharing your thoughts. And then um, also I didn't see it before I read you that last one, but she had um, a comment in here that she was thinking about Charlotte Rowe's work about lack of diversity in publishing mm -hmm. over, overall. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with that work at all, but um, maybe the audience would be um, interested in, in going out and researching that or, or learning more about it. I'm not familiar with it, but I want to read it now. So thank you so much <laughs> for the resource. Yeah, And Zoe is an author, <laughs> just to tie it all oh, back up to wonderful. authors we know. <laughs> and when you asked the question at the beginning and I said none, I thought, oh shoot, I know Zoe. I met her at our last Ignis. <laughs> <laughs> so I do know authors. I do, I do. I think we all do, but when we ask ourselves or are asked that initially, we don't think of the people around us as authors, which is something that we can change and we can promote each other's work. And again, that might be one of the ways that we start to address the disparity of voices and diversity in the scholarship out there is by pointing out all of the amazing things that a number of our colleagues are doing as well. It might not be in that peer-reviewed journal. It doesn't mean that it's not good information or valuable to people. We do have amazing colleagues in this system. Absolutely. Um, everybody I meet is just so fantastic and excellent um, at what they do. So I totally agree. Yeah, any other thoughts or comments for um, Derek? Um, Let's see, Ryer Banta says, um, do you have any thoughts on how to apply this to classes where students don't really typically engage in theory of that discipline, like maybe in an English 101 class? You know, one of the things that I try to do is not necessarily make it about a theory that's within the discipline. In English 101, if there's a specific topic or a specific author or a specific era that you're looking at, you could think of elements that are influencing the works that are created and let students really get to understand the context a little bit differently. Uh, within the idea of English 101, I'm thinking of all of the different authors of different periods that I read and you could let it be a historical 
examination or an economics basis or look at different cultural elements as well. So it, it's really trying to find that applied piece. It doesn't necessarily have to be a theory that explains directly what you're talking about, but there are lots of things that could be threaded in, again, that really just let students have a different lens through which to analyze. That's probably what I would recommend or try to brainstorm with you to find something that would engage the students. And just taking a cue from the things that you've said today, Derek, um, I would also say look to the people that you know and maybe that could somehow help you figure out what theory or topic. Because if you're trying to pull that personalization piece in and you want to try to get your students to know the authors, um, you could also look to you know those around you that you know who are authors so that you could help make that personal connection. Great point. And one of the things that I try to do in my instructional design rule is really let disciplines speak to each other. Oh, Zoe, since Google is always interesting to English 101 students, algorithms and oppression in, is super engaging. Yeah, there are lots of things out there that we could do. And if transparency is our goal within the research process to let students understand what it takes, there are lots of things regarding the oppression of voices also. Um, within communication, we have standpoint theory and muted group theory that really directly apply and they're not only about communication, it's anyone who is trying to communicate. So that could have salience in uh, English class as well. And it's amazing when I get to facilitate workshops or gatherings on my campus and our physics instructors are talking to our history professors and our English professors and our math instructors. They learn so much from each other. They don't seem like integrated disciplines, but there's so much that we benefit from and learn through collaboration. And again, if we're trying to promote the research that people are doing around us, we might learn about those connections that we didn't see before that can transform how our students engage with material and the relationship that they have with research and ideas as well. Great conversation. All right, anyone else have comments or questions? Anything they want to add to the discussion? All right, well, while we're waiting to see if anyone else uh, wants to contribute, uh, Derek, would it be okay if I um, put your contact email into the chat in case people have follow-up questions for you? Absolutely, please do. Perfect. Okay, I just put that into the chat so uh, you can um, get Derek directly at his Everett CC um, email address and uh, looks like the chat has quieted down so and we're getting near the three o'clock time so I'm going to go ahead and close us out okay. but if you do have any um, last minute comments anyone while um, I'm talking about next um, our ne upcoming webinar um, please feel free to go ahead and throw those into the chat and, and we'll get those addressed if we can and thank you so much Dirk that was a really interesting topic and thanks to Zoe thank for her you. great comments. And thank you too. everyone yeah. else yeah great conversation yeah, so. really good comments. Okay, I'm just going to switch back to our other slides here. And um, so Derek's done for the day unless you have a, another question to put into the chat. And then, um, oh, I see I forgot. I am just wrought with typos lately. I don't know what my deal is. Um, I'll just admit it here. I make mistakes <laughs> frequently and I'm a poor typist. Um, I'm just realizing that I didn't change the date on this slide. Um, that should be, um, it is a May date. It is a Thursday from 2 to 3. And let me just check my calendar. I think it's the 31st. So let me just make sure I tell you the right date. So go by what I say, not what you see. Yep, 2 p.m. on Thursday, May 31st is um, Ellen Bremen, and um, her topic is, did I miss anything important? Teaching students to communicate professionally regardless of your discipline. So I do hope that you will um, join us again for our um, final closing webinar of the 2018 season. So again, that's Thursday, May 31st at our regular time. 
And should you have any questions, um, please feel free to um, follow up with me. And I'll just go ahead and put my, I'm sorry you can hear me typing, I'm putting my um, email address into the chat as well. So um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me um, about anything. So thank you all for joining us today. It looks like even though we had a little bit of technical trouble and delay at the beginning, and again, thank you for your patience with that. Um, we're going to close out just a couple minutes early. Um, and just a reminder that all the IGNIS content is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0, so feel free to take it, adapt, and reuse um, as you find helpful. So thanks, everyone, and thank you again to Derek for joining us. Um, it was great. Thanks. And we'll hope, hope to see you on the 31st. Bye-bye.